Hello, my name is Dr. Marnie Falk. I am the Executive Director of the Mitochondrial Medicine Frontier Program at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. I am delighted to have you join us today for the Mito CME Education Event and to speak with you about mitochondrial disease therapeutics. I am the Scientific Advisory Board Member for the United Mitochondrial Disease Foundation and the Genesis Foundation, as well as on several pharmaceutical companies as listed here. I am also a research collaborator, consultant, or PI with multiple different life science companies in the therapeutic development space for mitochondrial disease. Mitochondrial diseases are highly heterogeneous in clinical presentation as well as in etiology. There is no single biomarker for mitochondrial disease, and it is now recognized that there are many genetic causes across both the mitochondrial DNA as well as the nuclear genome. Collectively, mitochondrial diseases affect at least one in every 4,300 people. And it is helpful to think of mitochondrial disorders as organ-based diseases, commonly with multi-organ failure, that are due to energy disruption or impairment of the oxidative phosphorylation system. And when thinking about therapies, it's further helpful to think about mitochondrial disorders based upon their molecular etiology and which biochemical or signaling pathway might become disrupted by the specific defect. And as you've heard earlier this morning, it's helpful to visit the mitochondrial disease sequence data resource that our community has built to provide information on the phenotypes and genotypes and specific variants that may cause mitochondrial disease. And to make this information that's available in MSeqDR about genetic causes of mitochondrial disease more readily accessible to frontline clinicians and trainees and researchers, we are excited to have published earlier this year a book named Mitochondrial Disease Genes Compendium, From Genes to Clinical Manifestations, to provide an all-in-one reference of mitochondrial disease from a gene perspective. On each gene page is provided information on the specific inheritance, age, clinical features, known therapies, support groups, and research for mitochondrial diseases caused by over 250 different genes. It's also helpful to think of the mitochondrion in its detail of all the different key pathways that are happening there. So the mitochondrion, as we know, has two membranes, an outer membrane that's highly permeable and an inner membrane that's highly impermeable. Within the inner mitochondrial membrane is where energy is made within the five complexes of the electron transport chain. In order for this pathway to be formed and functional, it requires nucleic acid to be brought into the mitochondria in the correct form. And for this to be made into mitochondrial DNA, which then is made into RNAs and into proteins to make 13 of the key components within the core of complexes one, three, four and five of the electron transport chain. Mutations in many of the genes encoding these subunits, as well as encoding many of the proteins involved in these processes lead to disruption of this pathway and therefore a failure to produce proper energy and mitochondrial disease. There's many other pathways that are involved besides these, including those involved in the fission and fusion and movement of the mitochondria, in, including quality control systems, and for bringing energy, which is high phosphate um, energy bonds um, in the form of adenosine triphosphate out of the mitochondria to provide energy for the rest of the cell. More than 1,500 proteins from the nucleus are imported into the mitochondria, and this is a really um, helpful way to think about where therapies may come from in terms of understanding which exact pathway within the mitochondria is disrupted. Over time, it's become clear that understanding the specific genetic etiology for a given patient is very important and may actually lead to understanding of specific therapies that may be useful for specific genetic indications. So this is a very helpful paper that came out 
um, by Dr. Prokish's group in 2017, which summarizes an example of some of the cofactors um, and vitamins and other therapies that may be worth considering and at specific doses when specific gene disorders are identified. But we know that there's many more gene disorders than just these, and we know that the patients can present, as you've heard this morning, with a range of different symptoms. In our survey published by Dr. Zolka Blee Cunningham et al. in 2018, we learned that patients on average may experience up to 16 different major medical problems, as listed here, and that the top five include weakness, fatigue, exercise intolerance, gastrointestinal problems, and balance problems. But there's a wide range of symptoms, and it becomes important to understand what symptoms are both prevalent and important, even if only present in a subset, when trying to understand what organs and symptoms to target for therapeutic development. To date, there have been few therapies that have been proven by clinical trials to be effective and there have been no cures for mitochondrial disease. There are zero FDA-approved therapies for mitochondrial disease at this time. And I think the reasons relate to being individually rare for each genetic disorder and many different genes and phenotypes causing the disorders overall. It is important to recognize exercise as therapeutic value, which you'll hear more about this afternoon from Dr. Zolkopli. Nutrition is also an important therapeutic avenue and we lack clarity on the optimal diet. We have reached out to regulatory partners together with major advocacy groups and pharmaceutical partners and academic colleagues in the field to work on the issues of lacking universal clinical trial design, outcome measures, and biomarkers for mitochondrial disease, which are all very important to plan clinical treatment trials in mitochondrial disease. We now are excited that multiple trials are emerging to address common clinical outcomes and specific genetically confirmed mitochondrial disease cohorts. When one considers therapies for mitochondrial disease, it's common to encounter the concept of a mitochondrial cocktail. Historically, this is a one-size-fits-all cocktail of supplements that are empirically prescribed to theoretically target mitochondrial enzymes and stress. While there's good rationale for their use, such as to increase free coenzyme Q pools, function as cofactors for enzymes, such as those that require the B vitamins, metabolite therapies that might replete secondary deficiencies that develop, activators of enzymes or antioxidants, there is no clinically trial proven evidence to support their use. That doesn't mean that they might not be helping some individuals, and some patients do report improved well being or energy on these therapies. There's also no standard doses that historically have been used, and the Mitochondrial Medicine Society in 2009 published an article summarizing what was known about the safety and the range of doses as well as effects to be monitored for when taking these therapies. And it's commonly recommended to consider a time-limited trial of these therapies and to monitor for apparent benefit or effect, given that most of these therapies are generally well tolerated with minimal adverse effects. Mitochondrial medicine physicians have greatly varied in their utilization of the mitochondrial cocktail. However, the Mitochondrial Medicine Society has worked to develop standardization of treatment guidelines for the mitochondrial medicines, as well as other preventative care. They now have guidelines that you can find for exercise, acute stroke, anesthesia, acute illness management, as well as for vitamin use. And for example, some of the consensus recommendations for vitamin and xenobiotic use are shown here, where coenzyme Q should be offered to most patients with a diagnosis of mitochondrial disease, not just for primary CoQ deficiency, and utilizing the reduced form, ubiquinol, that is the most bioavailable. Levels of CoQ in the blood should be followed, mostly within the white blood cells, the leukocytes, to help assess absorption and treatment adherence. Lipoic acid and riboflavin should also be offered to mitochondrial disease patients.
Folinic acid should be considered in patients with central nervous system manifestations, as well as those with cerebral spinal fluid deficiency of folic acid, or those known to have a disorder associated with um, folic acid deficiency. Carnitine has been a controversial therapy in mitochondrial disease. Up until about 2017, carnitine was very widely used, and then it was recognized that there could be long-term cardiac effects in the general population on carnitine. Therefore, carnitine is now only reserved for patients in whom there is a known deficiency of carnitine. Finally, um, it is recommended that levels of vitamin therapies be used when known to replete deficiency. And it's one of our goals and goals of others to develop better tests to help monitor the use of these therapies. Amino acid therapies for mitochondrial disease are commonly used in patients. Arginine or citrulline are used as nitric oxide donors to target microvascular endothelial ischemia that occurs in metabolic stroke. Intravenously, this is used at the time of acute stroke in MELAS patients, originally in adults and now often in children. It's generally well tolerated and it is important to monitor for hypotension and hypoglycemia, which if they do develop, are generally readily treatable. In addition, IV arginine is commonly used now in other types of metabolic strokes in mitochondrial disease patients, including in those with Lee syndrome. In our experience, patients with hemiplegic strokes showed in more than 50% of cases, strong clinical response by hospital discharge. Enteral use, either orally or through gastrostomy tubes, are also commonly used in mitochondrial disease patients for purposes of metabolic stroke prophylaxis. There's a comparative study of arginine versus citrulline ongoing at Baylor by Dr. Fernando Scalia uh, as part of the NIH-funded North American Mitochondrial Disease Consortium program. So overall, there has been an evolution in our understanding of the mitochondrial cocktail, and we prefer to utilize the term mitochondrial medicine therapies. It's important to remember that wherever you get your vitamins or medications, whether they're from a pharmacy or from a health food store, if they're being used to optimize health in a patient with disease, they're really drugs uh, and they're really medical therapies. And it's important that we recognize it as such and monitor as such. Very commonly in our group, we utilize a core set of vitamins that are very well tolerated where um, there, there's really very low risk of adverse events. And so these include multivitamins, a B50 complex vitamin to provide the recommended daily allowance of these cofactors that help mitochondrial enzymes. Ubiquinol is the preferred uh, form of coenzyme Q given its improved uh, bioavailability. And often antioxidants are used given that many patients with mitochondrial disease are known to have increased oxidative stress. In our group, we use both vitamin E, which provides total cellular antioxidant coverage, as well as lipoic acid, which provides more intramitochondrial antioxidant effect. We do use biotin when we have patients on lipoic acid, since it's needed uh, for lipoic acid um, um, function. And what you could also see is that depending on the type of mitochondrial disease, there's a range of other therapies that we might include in the standard cocktail. When there's complex one deficiency, we often use nicotinamide. We'll talk a little bit about nicotinic acid, which isn't very well tolerated in our patients, but nicotinamide um, also provides a source of NAD um, that is much better tolerated by patients without the flushing effects that make patients often stop nicotinic acid. Riboflavin is often utilized in complex one deficiency, given that it's a cofactor for complex one assembly. And when there is an elevated lactate to pyruvate ratio, there's evidence emerging that pyruvate therapy should be considered. When primary lactic acidosis is present, we often consider biotin as well as thiamine. In a range of different disorders, we consider folinic acid, uh, to replete folic acid in the central nervous system. And when possible, we stop their folic acid as it might compete with folinic acid for central nervous system uptake. We utilize creatine when there's exercise intolerance, muscle fatigue, or myopathy. 
And as I mentioned, we use arginine for stroke-like episodes. In addition, when we have basal ganglia lesions on an MRI without clear etiology, we will consider other um, medications that might help other classes of disorders, such as biotin and thiamine. And when there's refractory episodes, we might try additional amino acid therapies, such as citrulline and taurine. For patients with migraine headache, riboflavin may be helpful. And for patients with neuropsychiatric symptoms, both folinic acid and acetylcysteine um, might be indicated. For pigmentary retinopathy, lutein is considered useful, as well as N-acetylcysteine, which does have a CNS penetrance. And finally, when there's severe liver involvement or glutathione deficiency, we utilize N-acetylcysteine with the goal of bringing the plasma glutathione back into the normal range, since N-acetylcysteine provides the cysteine, which is essential for glutathione synthesis. So speaking about mitochondrial disease therapies, it's important to consider nutrition. We always have our patients evaluated by a registered dietitian who, enter, who evaluates their energy, protein and micronutrient intake, and assesses for relative undernutrition. With some of the issues um, that are evaluated discussed here related to understanding their unique energy expenditure, intake and absorption, whether they need supplemental feeds, through gastrostomy or parenteral nutrition, and also evaluating their swallowing function, their gut motility, behavioral issues, and reflux to optimize their nutritional intake. And it's become incredibly important to patients to optimize their nutrition um, and their overall function. Also, it's important to evaluate for micronutrient deficiency, and we strongly encourage avoiding fasting and encouraging frequent small meals. We increase fluid intake further when there's heat or metabolic stress. In terms of the macronutrient profile or ratio of carbohydrates, fat, and protein, there is no clear guidance for mitochondrial disease. The use of the ketogenic diet is highly controversial for while it increases ketones and succinate in the starvation response in mitochondrial biogenesis, as well as glutathione, it's often not tolerated in patients. Further, um, uh, patients who have oxidative phosphorylation dysfunction often have secondary fatty acid oxidation dysfunction and elevated triglycerides, and they're not able to burn or oxidize the fat. And that's one of the reasons, as well as some signaling alterations, that we're really concerned that high fat diets might actually exacerbate metabolic stress in mitochondrial disease. There's also been conflicting data in mouse models of mitochondrial disease, whether it's helpful or harmful, as well as long-term use considerations that make us not really consider a ketogenic diet except in cases of extreme refractory epilepsy. Discussion has been given as to whether the modified Atkins diet is worth pursuing in mitochondrial disease based upon some mouse models that had a nuclear gene mutation in the twinkle gene, a HeLa case that's involved in mitochondrial DNA replication um, and maintenance. And so these deleter mice seem to improve when on the modified Atkins diet. And therefore, a small human trial was tried in similar patients uh, with myopathy, with mitochondrial DNA deletions, who went from a normal diet to a, a modified Atkins or high fat diet with the ratios shown here, from over 40% carbs down to less than 10% carbs. And while healthy controls had no problems handling this diet for four weeks, all five patients within four to 11 days stopped the diet due to severe muscle pain, burning, and progression from legs to back to arms to neck, headaches, and increased fatigue. And on muscle biopsies, it was clear they had increased muscle fiber cell death or necrosis, elevated CK, higher lactates with exercise, and highly glycolytic muscles. And based upon this, it again supports that a high fat diet is probably not indicated in most mitochondrial disease patients. That said, there has been research to suggest that ketogenic diet components may hold potential therapeutic value because it's not the ketones themselves that raise the concern, but the high fat that must be tolerated in order to um, obtain the ketones. And these have included triacylglycerol infusions, triheptanoin, as well as decanoic acid, where the latter um, is a, a C10, 
um, fatty acid that has been shown in neuronal culture to improve mitochondrial mass, complex one activity, and P par gamma activity. But clinical trials of these therapies in mitochondrial disease have not yet been performed. We took decanoic acid and applied it to a model animal of complex one disease, and what we learned is that the mitochondrial amount in black, or the function of the respiratory chain, the membrane potential in white, was much less in our complex one disease worms. And yet, when we were able to give this C10 um, at either um, uh, this ratio or, or that ratio, you know, we were comparing different ratios. So this is comparing 90% uh, or 80% or of the C10. We were able, even within just 24 hours, to see um, improvement that was increased by 96 hours. These animals normally um, live about two weeks and the mutants live uh, significantly less but this C10 made the animals live longer. Um, and so this was very exciting um, for us. Um, and this is something, for example, that would be worth uh, pursuing um, evaluation of um, in clinical trials in patients. Finally, um, research within our own group by Dr. McCormick, whom you'll hear about later today, has suggested that low glycemic, high carbohydrate diets may have a therapeutic role in mitochondrial disease. And so the idea is that patients crave carbohydrates and feel better when um, eating carbohydrates and often during their crisis respond to dextrose containing IV fluids. Plus they have a higher glycolytic rate as when their mitochondria doesn't make energy properly, glycolysis is their only other option for doing so. There have been concerns with this diet um, in some animal models um, and glucose dysregulation is a concern that has to be evaluated as some patients more often in adults present with diabetes mellitus, and some other patients, such as more often children, may present with hypoglycemia. Finally, I'd like to discuss with you the approach to how we're going to identify and pursue evaluation of emerging therapies for mitochondrial disease. I like to think of the mitochondria more simply as a black box that makes certain products, and these include energy in the form of ATP, free radicals in the form of superoxide and hydrogen peroxide, nucleic acids such as pyrimidines, and NAD. And it's really important to realize there's ways to treat each of these products when they're either deficient or out of balance. So nutrition or glucose to feed glycolysis is another way to make ATP. Antioxidants may help balance some of the increased free radicals that happen in mitochondrial disease. NAD can be obtained by nicotinic acid, which is vitamin B3, nicotinamide, as well as a range of other therapies. And nucleic acids can also be provided in different forms. It's also important to recognize that when there's mitochondrial dysfunction, the therapies may not have to address the problems within the mitochondria themselves, whether they are primary or come from genetic problems or secondary and come from environmental problems. And so each tissue may have a different response to the mitochondrial dysfunction, depending on how metabolically active it is and how much energy it's getting. And we and others over time have identified that the cell reacts in a very similar way whenever there's mitochondrial dysfunction to change gene expression and specific signaling pathways to survive the problem. And what we realize is that we can address these problems and these changes, which may actually be contributing to the medical problems people experience. And as a simplified example, here's one cell and a mitochondrion in that cell where the electron transport chain is shown not to be working. And this activates the signaling pathway such as AMP kinase, as well as mitophagy, which takes some of the other organelles and changes their activity or revs them up both the ribosome for translation of nuclear gene products into proteins, as well as the lysosome that degrades proteins. And overall, the mitochondrion um, dysfunction leads to cellular proteotoxic stress. And this is really the state of a cell when there's mitochondrial disease. And so it becomes reasonable to try and temper these responses, either by changing the signaling molecules or the pathways that they control. 
And so there's specific drugs that are outlined here that we've used as examples, such as probucol, rapamycin, cyclohexamide, lithium chloride, 3 methyladenine in research models that prevent promising targets to consider in, in human mitochondrial disease. For example, a B3 form of nicotinic acid, as I mentioned before, when given to patient cells, the, the AMP kinase pathway is very active, and giving the cells from a mitochondrial disease patient nicotinic acid for just 24 hours quieted this response. The same thing with the AMP kinase activation. Further, the NADH and NAD were deficient in this patient, but responded very nicely to the nicotinic acid treatment and normalized um, um, in these patients. And this also translated to the therapy improving not just the signaling um, molecules, but also the, the cellular's cellular ability to utilize oxygen effectively. And so we don't think that this molecule is replacing complex one, but we think it's helping to replete a product of the mitochondria that becomes deficient, and when you restore it, can help the rest of the cell function better. And very recently, a pilot study was performed in Finland by Dr. Sumalainen's group and published, as indicated here, in five patients with, a, with mitochondrial myopathy presenting as CPEO, or chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia, compared to 10 controls. And using doses that are given in adults for lipid disorders, they actually evaluated the effects on NAD changes in blood and muscle. And while all patients experienced side effects, including flushing, as I mentioned earlier, tingling, and GI irritation, there also was significant effect seen in restoring NAD both in the blood and the muscle, as well as the mitochondrial function, the muscle strength, and exercise performance. But it is important to recognize that there can be some side effects like glycogen storage in the, um, in the muscle and anemia uh, can occur. So this is a promising pilot study that suggests it should be further studied in our patients or other drugs in this classway that potentially are better tolerated. Another example of a promising therapeutic target for mitochondrial disease is probucol, which targets the disrupted signaling that occurs in primary mitochondrial disease. Here, we have utilized probucol to treat the glomerular kidney disease that occurs in PDSS2 mice that are unable to synthesize coenzyme Q. These animals have very leaky kidneys with very high urine albumin collected in 24 hours. When treated with probucol, this albuminuria is either prevented or reversed. And this is a candidate therapy that we hope to go to clinical trial next year. And so it's important to recognize that there's a whole arsenal of therapies emerging from mitochondrial disease. Some of them change signaling pathways, activity, such as sirtuins, the mTORC1 pathway, PPAR, and AMP kinase. Some of them are going to change um, cellular processes that are overactive in mitochondrial disease in response to mitochondrial disease, such as translation and autophagy. Some are going to be nutrition-based, and quite a few are antioxidants. And ultimately, we'd like to see laboratory tests developed to test each drug in each patient using their own cells or animal models to both identify which are tolerated and potentially which are efficacious. And this involves precision mitochondrial medicine, where we utilize a range of models, including worms, which are an invertebrate model, or C. elegans, zebrafish, which is a vertebrate model, mammalian models such as mice, and cells from patients directly, both fibroblasts as well as blood cell lines, as well as sometimes muscle cell lines or other. And in these models, we can create genetic or pharmacologic models of mitochondrial disease in which to test empiric therapies that have been suggested, as well as drug or genetic libraries, and determine which has effect on meaningful outcomes such as survival and function, and then also understand readouts of physiology in the mitochondria and across the cell. And from this, we can take therapeutic leads, apply them to specific rare disease patients, and evaluate patient important outcomes. And this is the goal of precision mitochondrial medicine, to get the right therapy to the right patient for the right indication. And to do this, we utilize most commonly, simple model animals that are very high throughput, such as C. elegans, where we may take a healthy animal, 
and a genetically um, modified disease animal and test it with a range of therapies and see which improves survival. And when it does, we might go back and understand the metabolism and the signaling effects and the physiology of why and how that works. We can also compare different doses and compare drugs to each other. So over the years, we've tested dozens of therapies and have identified several key classes of therapies that show promising effect in mitochondrial disease models. And these include antioxidants, metabolic modifiers, and signaling modifiers, where this is showing you the relative lifespan of the GAS1 complex 1 disease worm, which has a NDUFS2 complex 1 subunit nuclear gene mutation. And this is the wild type lifespan, which is about 50% longer. And you can see within each class, here N-acetylcysteine, here dichloroacetate or glucose, and here nicotinic acid or probucol significantly improve the lifespan of the animals towards that of the healthy animals. And we can also utilize zebrafish, a vertebrate model of mitochondrial disease, to evaluate many different aspects of the genetic disorders or the toxic stress that might exacerbate mitochondrial disease and therapies that might prevent it. And zebrafish have organs, so you can understand cardiac function, renal function, hearing, vision, um, the um, and the brain. And here, for example, you can see a healthy brain, which is this golden yellow, and when we expose it to a mitochondrial poison in the larval stage, you can see that very quickly it dies, it turns black. But if we have N-acetylcysteine present, then it can withstand the stress and it survives without brain death. And it's, the effect is um, shown here for N-acetylcysteine and it's even more pronounced for vitamin E. And over the years, uh, with the help of uh, both uh, research grants from the federal government as well as family funded programs, we've created a series of genetic models in complex one, complex four, complex five, uh, as well as pyruvate dehydrogenase and several other models more recently, where we can create uh, CRISPR-Cas defined genetic um, mutations or rescue, as well as test a range of therapies on animal survival, brain health, cardiac function, activity, and so on. And we've now uh, been working to create high throughput drug screens in these simple models using automated robotic systems to test in parallel both the survival and the activity um, of the different animals, as well as the overall development and different aspects of mitochondrial physiology so that we can identify not just a therapy that might work, but the most potent therapy that fits a specific condition. And so to end, it's really important that we think about new ways to develop therapies for mitochondrial disease. Once we come up with a definition, be it genetic, biochemical, or a phenotype-based definition, we need to identify prioritized outcomes that patients would like to see improved, survival and function, as well as specific biomarkers that may really help us understand what is and isn't working. We then can consider all the different treatment options, which include off-label FDA drugs, medical foods, nutrients, dietary supplements, investigational therapies, and cell or gene therapies, and take this before moving to a clinical trial into the laboratory where we can now efficiently and effectively do what we call therapeutic cross-training or take these preclinical laboratory model animals and cells, um, which may be different given a specific type of mitochondrial disease, and take a given therapy and show that it has safety and efficacy across different models so that you can improve your confidence that this will be well tolerated and identify specific responders to take forward to design a better trial uh, with more people likely to benefit um, and safely um, handle the drug and allow it to be approved to become standard of care. And that is why we've created the Mitochondrial Medicine Frontier Program at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia so that we can continually uh, perform um, these interacting activities of optimizing our patients' clinical care, best understanding their diagnosis, optimizing their management, as we've discussed earlier, pursue clinical research that helps us understand specific outcomes and be able to design clinical trials, and work um, iteratively to identify the clinical questions and concerns that need to be addressed on specific organs or outcomes or disorders to identify therapies to be able to take forward.
This work has involved an enormous number of colleagues across both the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and our laboratory and our clinical research team and the University of Pennsylvania, as well as colleagues nationally and internationally. And we're, we're deeply grateful for the funding that's allowed this um, uh, to pursue, as well as the partnership of families to guide our, our work. Thank you. I'm happy to address any questions.